Good morning, church. Can you please stand to your feet? Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. We're so glad that you are with us this morning. Just want to encourage you to just release yourself. Be free in the spirit of the Lord in this place and worship God with us. Come on. Here we go. Two, three, go. Yeah. Anybody got a reason to praise him today? I said, anybody got a reason to praise him? He's worthy. Thank you, Lord. the song. Come on, let's sing it out. Our God, say it. Our God, a firm foundation. Our rock, the only solid ground. His nation to rise and fall. Yes, Jesus. Kingdoms, strong now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Can I get somebody to say it really loud? Say We trust the name of Jesus. Sing it.
and an honor to be in his presence today. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God of praise. We serve a God of light. We serve a God of joy. We serve a God of peace. Thank you, Lord. Worship him today.
can stand against the Lord. No one can. No one will. Who can stand against the King? No one can. No one will.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Victory belongs to Jesus. Hallelujah. Like, it feels good to know that you're part of the winning team. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I, I, I checked the end of the story. And, I, you know, sometimes, you know, when you read a book, you can, you can, you can get to the beginning and some people is get caught up in the middle, but I like to race to the end. I like to see what the end is going to be. And I've come to learn that in the end, like, we win. Hallelujah. Because we belong to Jesus. Hallelujah. And I know that's where my victory is. And for that, we worship him. Hallelujah. For that, he is worthy of all worship. Hallelujah. You're worthy of worship, God. Hallelujah. Could not worship him enough. Glory to God. Father, we love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, your love, your kindness. God, I just pray right now, God, that you would allow your spirit, oh, Father, to move in our midst on today, God. Father, that you would break every chain. God, that you would free, God, uh, uh, every uh, f person from every spirit that's not like you, God. Father, Lord Jesus, we pray right now that you would heal every manner of sickness, God. Oh, Father, that you would regulate every unregulated mind, God, and that you would mend every broken heart, God. Father, we pray right now that the word, that as it goes forth, God, that it was set out to do what you intend for it to do, God. We welcome you in this place. We welcome you in our individual temples, God, and we ask that you would have your way. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome to You Flourish Church. Uh, my name is Kurt. I serve as one of the pastors here at You Flourish Church. We are excited that you have come out to join us for worship today. You could have went anywhere in the city, but you decided to come and join us today. And for that, we are truly, truly grateful. Uh, just got a couple of things that we uh, want to bring to your attention. Uh, next, this month, actually, we embark on our second year of ministry. Uh, we make our two years here. Yes, yes, at You Flourish Church. And we're going to kick it off with fall kickoff come uh, next uh, Sunday at uh, September 10th. Immediately following service will be right on the front lawn. You can bring your lawn chairs. There's going to be food. There's going to be bounce houses. There's going to be a live DJ face painting. It's going to be all kind of amazing things happening. And we invite you out to come by and, and join us uh, for some food, some fellowship, and, and just a, a really great time in the Lord. And so uh, we invite you out for that. Uh, speaking of which, uh, we also can still use a few hands, and so if you uh, may have a desire to help out with that, uh, you'll be able to find more information on Plug Me In with that. If you're looking for an easy way to get connected here at You Flourish Church, we make it very, very simple. Every third Wednesday of the month, we have a men's pizza night. You don't have to be a member here at You Flourish Church. Uh, just an easy way to get plugged in and connect with other people uh, of the body here at You Flourish Church, and, and the just see some of the amazing things that's happening uh, in that space. So we invite you out to that again every third Wednesday at 6 p.m. right here in our, in our fellowship hall. Uh, and, and not to be outdone, but the women gather as well at 9 a.m. every third Saturday. I hear they're having an amazing time. Um, again, it's just a really easy way uh, to get connected with other believers and to see what's going on here at You Flourish Church. So we invite you out uh, for that if you are a, a woman. I also want to bring to your attention on um, the weekend of September 29th through October 1st, there'll be a men's camp at Camp uh, Timber Lee. I'll be one of the speakers on that, on that Saturday, and so it's just a great way for men to kind of come together, uh, get away for a weekend, and have an opportunity to connect uh, with the Lord in, in real intimate ways. So you can find out more information about the men's camp through our, our Plug Me In, and I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, uh, for other ways to get connected here we is, is serving. Serving is always a, a really unique way to uh, find community uh, here at Euflores Church. And one of the uh, ministries we want to highlight today is, is our safety team. We want to keep our children safe. We want to keep our congregants safe. And it's just a really easy way to get connected. Uh, and William, who leads our sa sir, uh, safety team, I'm sorry, will be out in the foyer at the end of service. So you could, you could see him as well. And so consider what that may look like uh, one Sunday a month serving on our 
our safety team. Speaking of plug me in, I've been talking about that a little bit. In the seat backs in front of you, you'll find this plug me in card. It has a QR code where you can scan the QR code and you can find opportunities to serve, whether your interest is in the men's camp, whether your interest is to serve on a safety team or anything else, you'll be able to find that information there. If you're looking for a small group, you can browse groups on the, uh, uh, on, on the QR code on the back side. You'll find a QR code for giving. You'll also find a QR code for downloading our apps and that way if you ever miss our services you'll find our app uh, uh, you'll find our services and all the sermons on, on our app and uh, just a moment Pastor Ronaldo is going to continue us on in 1 Corinthians before we do I just want to mention every first and third Sunday we normally have our student ministry uh, this is one of those Sundays uh, we will not have a mini a student ministry today uh, we will pick back up on September 17th and again Pastor Ronaldo is going to continue us on and uh, our First Corinthians four, uh, First Corinthians fourteenth is the fourteen is the uh, is the chapter that we'll be covering. One other thing that I just forgot, just want to bring to your attention: there will not be any parking in the front. Uh, for fall kickoff next week, uh, the par portion of the block will be blocked off, but you'll be able to park into the, in, in the parking lot. And we also have parking here at Golden Gate Funeral Home. Uh, so just want to throw that out. Again, Pastor Ronaldo is coming. He's going to continue us in 1 Corinthians. But before he comes up, why don't you just greet a few people who are sitting close by? Good morning. It is so good. It is so good to gather together. It's so good. It's an honor to open up the Word of God together uh, with you. Uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're going to pick up in verse 13. But before we do that, before we jump into that, would you, would you meet with me? Would you meet our Lord with me together in prayer? Lord God, we, we come to you, Lord, not, not as a ritual, not as a formality, but Lord, to, to cry out and to confess our dependence on you, to confess my dependence on you. God, I ask for your presence. I ask for your might, I ask for your power to heal, to transform, to save, to edify. Glorious God, would you do that which only you are able to do? Would you do that which we can, would you do beyond, exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what we could dream of in your holy Name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Anybody know? Anybody know who's playing that guitar? That's B.B. King. Anybody know that guitar's name? That's Lucille. All right, B.B. King and Lucille were a match made in heaven. He won 15 Grammys, 
Somebody said of B.B. King that he transformed, he revolutionized the way that the electric guitar was played before B.B. King. People played the electric guitar like an acoustic guitar until he came. In 2003, Rolling Stone magazine rated the top guitarist of all time, and he was placed third. B.B. King was a legend, a a, a genius, a, a luminary, but his humility was uncanny when he heard, when he heard that he was ranked the top third guitarist that has ever played the guitar, his response was, there must be a mistake. Top 50, maybe, but three? Here's some other things that he said about him and the guitar. He said, I'm stupid when it comes to the guitar. They waited for a punchline, but that was the end of his sentence. He said, I don't play nothing like I'd like to play. I guess what I'm saying is when I learn how to play, I'll let you know. He was so humble. He was so down to earth. And at one point, he led a photographer and a, and a reporter onto his tour bus, and he was so normal. He was so kind. He was worried about their well-being because they were going to be driving down this highway in Mississippi where a lot of people died, and he was concerned about their well-being. That was his concern when he was talking to them. And when they hopped out, when they hopped out of that bus, the reporter turned to the photographer, and he said, does he realize he's B.B. King? Does he realize he's B.B. King? I love that question. Does he realize who he is? I love that question. Does he realize who he is? I love that question. Church, do you realize who you are? Do you realize that you are the body of Christ? Do you realize that you are a royal priesthood? Do you realize that you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you realize that you're a new creation? Do you realize that? Do you realize you're a new creation? Do you remember the old creation? Do you remember the original creation? God speaks. Right? The word of God comes and and that which did not exist comes into existence. Right? And God creates and, and he's creating and everything he creates is good and it's good and there's this rhythmic and it was good and it was good and it was good and it was good until it crescendos when he creates humanity. He creates humanity to bear his Image. They are made in his image. In other words, they are created to reflect him. They are created, uh, uh, mankind, humanity is created to reflect him. This diversity, this male and female are created to reflect him. And in the new creation, we are newly created. We are renewed. We are this new creation that is to image him. We're supposed to demonstrate to the world what he is like. Let me say that a little bit better. We're supposed to demonstrate to the universe what he is like. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 3.10. So that through the church, he says this in Ephesians 3.10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That through the church, right, the wisdom of God goes on display 
right, to, to, to heavenly things we don't even understand through the church. Church, that's you. You are on display to demonstrate to heavenly beings what God is like in his wisdom. Do you realize that you are a new creation? Church, do you realize you are the body of Christ? And if we're the body of Christ, if we are the body of Christ, when someone sees us, should they not see Christ more clearly? Should they not see Christ with better clarity? Should they not see Christ with better precision? Should they not see Christ with better accuracy? And the Spirit instructs us how to do that through the faithful apostle. Pick up 1 Corinthians 14 with me in verse 13. Therefore, therefore one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he doesn't know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. While prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, The whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter. Will they not say that you're out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling on his face, he will worship and declare that God is really among you. Paul is instructing us if we are the body of Christ and we should correctly display to the world what he is truly like, here is his instructions. Verse 13, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. That word therefore links what we're about to read with the first 12 verses of chapter 14. But chapter 14 is linked to chapter 13, which is linked to chapter 12. But in chapter 12, what Paul has laid out is that we, right, the Holy Spirit comes into us and he creates this new thing, which is the church, but he calls us the body of Christ. And the way that the spirit comes and fills us, he fills us each uniquely, but he bonds us together in one body. So we are diverse, but we are one. But in that diversity, in the uniqueness of those giftings, the same motor, the same propeller should push, should catapult, should propel us forward. And that motor is love, which he talks about in chapter 13. He says, this is how, this is what love looks like. And then in verse 14, he says, here's what love looks like. Here's what love looks like when it shows up in your unique gifting. It shows up as the edification, as the strengthening, as the building up, as the upbuilding of others. 
right? He focuses on others. And so he has been saying that prophecy when we're congregated is better than speaking in tongues when we're congregated because speaking in tongues is a heavenly language that you speak to God with. But when you speak the tongues of humans, other humans are edified. They are built up. They need that intelligibility. They need to understand what it is that you're saying in order to be built up. And so Paul says, therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret right? So tongues, which is a good thing. He's already established that in the earlier part of this chapter. It's a good thing, but it's not a gathered thing because we don't understand. And so if somebody is going to do it, they need to be in prayer that it gets translated, that it gets interpreted for, verse 14, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Don't read that as a bad thing. Read that as a not gathered thing, right? If I pray in a tongue, yes, my my spirit is praying, but my mind's unfruitful. So he says, what am I gonna do? 15, what am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing praise with my mind also. Also, he calls us to a holistic, all of life existence. That Jesus had said, love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind. So all of you and your neighbor as yourself. Right, So your relationship with God should so fill you up and it begins to overflow and flood over and spill out so that it edifies your neighbor. And to do that, you need to do so in a manner they understand because that's how people are built up. People grow by you starting where they presently are. They have to understand what you're saying. I love this guy, I said this once, how how do you explain to a child who's never seen a cow what a cow is? How do you explain to a child who's never seen a cow what a cow is? You start with what they know. So you say a cow is like a puppy, only bigger. It has horns and goes moo. You've gotten closer to explaining to a child who's never seen what a cow is, what a cow is, because you must start where they are. They need to be intelligible to them. Otherwise, verse 16 tells us, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving? One, he doesn't know what you're saying. How are you gonna amen if you don't understand, right? So when we are gathered together, Paul has this concern. Paul has this obsession. Paul has this preoccupation that when we are gathered together, it ain't about your edification. It's about how you edify, how you strengthen, how you build up others. Verse 17, for you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. Listen, that first part, that's a good thing. You may be giving thanks. Paul concedes that. Paul says that's a good thing, but you can do that anywhere. But when we are gathered, you need to function in a way that uplifts others. Right, the previous verse, he talks about the one in the position of the outsider. How are they gonna say amen? Here he's saying, if you do things that only edify you, how is another going to be edified? Where did he get this idea? Paul is the very one who says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
Paul's not the destination. Paul's the bridge. He's leading you. He is showing you how to get there. That's why he says, imitate me as imitate Christ. Here's what he says in a different letter. Here's what he says in Philippians. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, right? Only let your life do this. Make sure that your life is worthy. It's in alignment. It fits with the gospel of Christ. And then let's jump to to, to, to the next chapter where he shows us how to do that. He says, here's how you live a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. You do nothing from selfish ambition. You don't do nothing that it's about you, but in humility, you count others as more significant than you. You elevate others, you place them higher than you do you. Verse four, let each of you look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others, right? Don't focus only on what you need, focus on what others need. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Put on the the, the mindset of Jesus. Right? How do, we, how do we do this where we're elevating others and, 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 and not ourselves? We put on the mind of Jesus. What was he like? Who? Though he was in the form of God, verse 6 tells us, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Where does Paul get this idea of building up others? Where does Paul get this idea of elevating others? Where does Paul get this idea of not obsessing about yourself, but being about the edification of others? He's following Jesus. Jesus has showed him the way of how to do that. So then when he is talking to the church, when he is talking to the body of Christ, he is appealing to them saying, listen, listen, you have all of these gifts and every good gift comes from above. Some of those gifts will build you up. Some of those gifts are gonna build you up and that's a good thing. But when we come together, when we are gathered, you tuck those to the back and you utilize, you flex with the muscles that build up the entirety of the body. When we come together, we do that. Verse 17, for you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God, verse 18 tells us. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. That's an unexpected turn. It might seem like he's putting tongues down. He is not doing that. He is, he's saying, listen, I'm thanking God I am thanking God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. I give thanks to God. He is is thankful for the gift of this heavenly language that he has that allows him to pray to God in this way. Nevertheless, verse 19 tells us, nevertheless, in church, look at those two words, in church, I would rather speak Five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue, which edify me. Listen, he has just said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. 
right? His own edification isn't a bad thing. Church, I do all kinds of things when we are not together to edify myself. They tend to isolate me and bring me my introverted self out as I focus on me. I do that when we are not gathered. I focus on my own strengthening up. I focus on my own building up. I focus on my own edification when we are not gathered. It's a good thing. Paul says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but nevertheless, in church, when we are gathered together, I'm gonna highlight, even if it's just five, even if it's just five words that will make sense to you, that will be intelligible to you in order to instruct others. There it is again. He is obsessed. He is preoccupied. He is focused on the building up of others. And he says this, brothers, verse 20, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. Some of y'all have had babies. Some of y'all presently have babies. Some of us just love babies. They are like the cutest thing on the entire planet. But sometimes at 2 a.m. when the entirety of the house is asleep and a pacifier falls out of a baby's mouth and rolls like two inches over. Instead of the baby considering the rest of the population of the household and saying, listen, this ain't that big of a deal. The pacifier's literally right here. I could just grab it and put it back in my mouth. That way, my parents would get sleep. That way, the next morning, when they go to work and interact with other humans, they won't be in rage mode because they haven't slept for a year. But babies don't do that. Do you know why babies don't do that? I'm going to... I'm gonna drop some sociological, psychological truth bomb on you. Do you know why they don't do that? Because they're babies. Because they're babies. And babies only think about what they need. That is the definition of a baby. And Paul says, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Right, I'm gonna say this next part with this little introduction, okay? When you go to the doctor's office, right, and they're about to stick a needle in you, you have this one question in your mind, is this gonna hurt, right? Is this gonna hurt? Right, I was, I, was, I was recently there, I was recently there, and, and the nurse was like, couldn't figure out where my vein was, right? So she kind of just kept sticking, and she just kind of kept twisting and turning and sticking. Now, on the outside, I was James Dean. On the outside, I was Denzel. I could not have been cooler. I could not have been cooler. My wife was in the room, I got, I got an alibi, right? I was cool. On the inside, I was the scaredy cat, Steve Urkel. I was mad. I was angry. I was uncool. Yeah, I'm about to stick a needle. And you can be Denzel on the outside. This might hurt a little bit. But it's just going to be a little bit. Listen, so many of us come to church 
with the mindset of how is this gonna edify me? How is this specific song to my liking? How is what they are saying specifically good for me? What am I gonna get out of this? How is this gonna build me up? And Paul says it this way. He says it in his first century Greco-Roman way. Do not be children in your thinking. Let me translate that to 21st century English speaking Milwaukee. Paul is saying, listen, if you come to us when we are gathered and your purpose is your own edification, grow up. Grow up. That's what babies do. They cry out in the middle of the night without any consideration for another because they're babies. And we're gonna need some of y'all to be grown-ups. We're gonna need some of y'all to be mature in your thinking, on your posture, on your outlook, which means to have this focus and this preoccupation with others. Now, Paul is, 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 is saying this again and again and again. Listen, when we come gathered, that was last week's sermon, and that's this week's first part, right? That when we are gathered together, your preoccupation, your focus should be the upbuilding, the lifting up of the whole body, what's good for all, what is the common good. But this question still lingers, well, maybe, maybe this thing that we are doing isn't for the believers, it's for the unbelievers. And Paul addresses that next. Verse 21, in the law, it is written by people of strange tongues and by lips of foreigners will I speak to this people. And even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. All right, so Paul quotes the law. He means the Old Testament here because he's talking about Isaiah. And what was happening in Isaiah is Isaiah is prophesying that things are not going well, right? That, that the children of Israel are not being faithful. And so God is going to fulfill his, what he said. There are blessings and there's curses. If you are faithful, we go one way. If you're unfaithful, we go another way. And what he says here in 21 is by people of strange tongues, I will speak. What does that mean? It means this, y'all are getting invaded. There's going to be an invasion from a foreign country. They're gonna come in and you're not gonna be able to understand what they are saying. And even when that happens, the faithless still, God is telling them, even then still the faithless, the unfaithful, the one who does not believe will not listen to me. Thus, verse 22, tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. So what he's saying is this, listen, tongues are good. Tongues are good, but they're not a sign for believers. They're a sign for unbelievers, which leaves us with this question, what kind of sign? I received some signs throughout my life, some of them good, some of them bad. In junior high, I kept receiving this sign again and again and again. It sounded like this, Ronaldo, go to the principal's office. That was a sign that I had just pushed it too far, right? That was a sign for me that I had stepped one foot too far. I remember one time in gym class, 
um, I was, I'm in the locker room. I'm changing to get out into gym class. And I'm telling you, I am telling you, the, the second I, I step out of, the lo- out of the locker room into the gym, the second the gym teacher looks at me and he goes, Ronaldo, go to the principal's office. And I was like, I did not do anything. And he says, I know, but you will. Go to the principal's office. And I was like, fair enough. That was a sign, but it was not a good sign. And what Paul is saying, yes, tongues are a sign. And they were a sign, they were a negative sign for those who do not trust back then. And they are also a negative sign today. Verse 23, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your mind? So back then, it was a negative sign. And when you come in today, it's also a negative sign. They're going to say, those who don't believe, that you're out of your minds. Listen, in the animal kingdom, there are a lot of strange behaviors and strategies in the animal kingdom of what males do to attract females. Right, like the male peacock, for example, the male peacock, for example, will stretch out his feathers to attract a female, right? In in, in Papua New Guinea, the birds of paradise will do a very elaborate dance, a very elaborate dance to attract a mate. But in the animal kingdom, no animal is stranger No animal is weirder in doing things to attract a female than humans. I remember being in a coffee shop and I was discipling a dude. It was one of those like split level coffee shops where you're at the top and you can see the bottom. And I'm I'm, I'm having a biblical conversation with this dude and he stops me. He stops me and he points down at the bottom. He stops me, and we're in the middle of a coffee shop. I look down, and he points at this dude, and he says, my dude is doing push-ups in a coffee shop. Like, who does that? Who in a coffee shop starts doing push-ups? Bro, I know what you're up to, and it ain't gonna work. Now, I don't wanna just throw him under the bus, right? I'm guilty. Like, I remember being in high school. I remember being in high school, and a bunch of us were at the park, right? Some boys and some girls, and we're all at the park. And, and, and one of the guys does something. You've probably seen this in a movie where somebody, like, jumps up in the air, like, leans to one side and clicks their heels together. You know what I'm talking about? Well, somebody did that, and the ladies laughed. And all the guys were like, oh, it's on because apparently this works, right? So, so a friend of mine, a friend of mine hops on a picnic table, jumps off the picnic table, so then he can get not one, but two clicks before gravity brings him back to the ground. And I was like, sucker, I can beat that. So I see a tree with a lend. And I'm like, I'm gonna hop up on this limb and I'm gonna grab it. And I'm gonna click my heel like 73 times. This is gonna be hilarious. So I jump up, I grab the limb and the whole thing comes down. So now I am sitting there with my gluteus maximus on the earth and with a limb on my chest. And sometimes when human males are doing things to attract human females, 
Some of us that have been around the block and have done some of this, we just wanna say, look, what you're doing ain't communicating what you think it's communicating. You think it's communicating something good. We all think you're a weirdo. And that's what Paul is saying. Listen, when unbelievers come in, when we do things that only edify ourselves and unbelievers come in, when we are doing things that elevate ourselves and edify ourselves, not only is our brother and sister not built up, but the unbeliever walks in from outside and like, they're out of their minds. That's insane. They're crazy. So Paul closes us off by saying, verse 24, but if all prophesy, but if all prophesy and an unbeliever outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so falling in his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. Paul has been arguing that prophecy builds up the body And then he says, not only that, but prophecy builds up not only the body, but it is effective for what it is that our hearts are to do, right? Because God has done something incredibly unique. Do you realize that you are the body of Christ? Do you realize that you are the temple of the Spirit? Do you realize that you are a new creation? Do you realize that you are the body of Christ and God really is present among you? So when we do things, not for our own selfish ambitions, not in our own self-seeking, but we follow Jesus whose mindset was to elevate others even to the point where he went to the death on a cross, when we follow him, Right, And what we do uplifts and builds up others, which Paul here is calling prophecy, more of that in a second. The unbeliever says, God is really here. Something is really going on here. There's something actually going on here. Because ever since the fall, we began to hide. Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, and when they saw the presence of God, they hid but the gospel in our presence, the gospel vocalized and seen in our midst does something different. It does the opposite of what Adam and Eve did. In 25, it tells us the secrets of his heart are disclosed, but this time it's good. Back then, they, their, their secrets of Adam and Eve and their hearts were disclosed and they hid but we bring the gospel, we bring the gospel. So the secrets of his heart are disclosed. So falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. So how do we do this? How do we prophesy? I want you to notice that in this part, Paul is not assigning prophecy to one person or two. He is not assigning prophecy to specific parts of the body. He is saying, all. How does that work? Well, how did prophecy always work? We tend to think of prophecy as predicting a future event, and that is prophecy, but prophecy is way bigger than that. Prophecy is warning. Prophecy is saying, listen, here's what, the, here's what God has said. How do we walk in that? Prophecy is encouragement, Right, prophecy was, was, was the prophets encouraging people along the way, helping them understand who God was. So how do we do that today? We stick close to the Lord. We stick close to his word. We have to know what he is saying because what does a prophet do? A prophet communicates what God first said and here's what God has said. But it's more than that. It's not less than that, but it's more than that. How do we do that? We walk closely with the Spirit. We walk closely with the Spirit. So the word that we are giving is timely so that it fits what the other person needs. It's not a random fun fact. It's not not a verse on a t-shirt or a coffee mug. 
It's specific to that time and to what is happening in that moment. How do we combine what the word of God is doing with what they're doing? The spirit leads you. The spirit guides you. The spirit takes you there. So listen, when we do that, when we do that, not only is the believer built up, but the unbeliever hears. But how can they call on whom they have not believed? How can they believe in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without it being preached to them or spoken to them? So it has to be intelligible. The good news of salvation that God became a human being who became the fullness of our sins, who died in our place, has to be communicated in a way that is understood. We get that from his word, but at the perfect timing. How do you and I step into the perfect timing? Oh, we don't, but the spirit does. But the spirit absolutely does. Church, would you step into this together with me? Church, do you not realize that you are the body of Christ? Do you not realize that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Do you not realize that you're a new creation? Do you not realize that you are the body of Christ? Would you pray with me? Lord God, glorious Lord, glorious King. Lord, we, what an honor, what a joy. Lord, what a miracle that this little me and this little us are truly and genuinely the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit, a new creation. Lord God, I ask for the presence and power of your spirit. I ask for the presence and the power and the goodness of your spirit to move in us. Lord, so that we might think like John the Baptist thought, he must decrease and I must, excuse me, he must increase and I must decrease. Lord, let us decrease so that we might build up others. And Lord, would you bring forth edification, sanctification, and salvation. In your holy name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor Ronaldo, for the word that was delivered on this morning. If there's uh, something in the word that you've heard and uh, you have not taken that step to give your life to the Lord and you want to take that step today, it's uh, fairly simple. The Bible says that if you can... That's Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, that you shall be saved. And so we will have the prayer team on the side here that's uh, ready to pray with you uh, this morning. Uh, We have Shelly and Deanne. And if there's just something that's going on in your life and you just want special prayer, again, the prayer team will be right here on the side here ready to pray with you on this morning. So we had an opportunity to worship and, and music, and we've had an opportunity to worship around the word, and now we just come to a portion of service where we will worship in our giving. Uh, here at Flourish Church, we have three ways that you can give. You can simply uh, text the dollar amount you wish to give to the number 84321. Uh, you can go to our QR code, which will take you to our website at Helping You Flourish. Uh, dot org on the on the plug me in card and you can follow the online on 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 screen prompts and it will direct you what you would need to do. The third way that we give is right here in person. And in just a moment, we're going to invite you to come uh, from the middle aisles and return uh, down the sides of the aisle. If you're not giving in person, feel free to just walk right uh, past uh, the offering basket. Um, and in just a moment, we're going to put you in the auspice of our ushers, and we will begin to worship in our giving.
you lead us? Spirit, would you lead us? God, would you lead us farther than we could imagine, deeper than we could fathom? God, would you bind us? Would you, you've created, would you truly create? Lord, something that resembles, something that reflects your image. Lord, not in, not perfectly, but truly and genuinely. Lord God, we need you. We trust you. We entrust ourselves into your hands in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated.